Well, to, to start our thinking this morning, I would like to, for us to think a little bit about curing what I'm calling worldview myopia. How do we develop a clear-sighted, Christ-centered worldview? Now, when I was younger, I was a pilot. Not, not of big planes, but just small planes, just one little engine. And we had to go in for an annual physical examination, including our eyes. And one year, I'd been flying quite a bit, I went in for my examination, and he said, uh, tell me the letters on the chart. And I said, what chart? <laughs> I was in trouble. Now, I had short-sightedness. Now, he called it myopia. I couldn't see things that were far away. Now, that might not be a problem for some people, but if you're a pilot, that's a problem. And I'm convinced that many Christian scholars also have worldview myopia. When I was a teenager, I read this great little book by J.B. Phillips. He did one of the early contemporary translations of the Bible that I loved when I was a teenager. But J.B. Phillips wrote this little book called Your God is Too Small. And I'm thinking some of us Christian scholars, we have a worldview that is too small. So I'd like to look at how we can have a full worldview. Now, worldview, by definition, is world-encompassing. So how can you truly have a worldview without it being all-encompassing? Now, uh, Dorothy Sayers, a good friend of C.S. Lewis, wrote a letter. I just looked up the date of the letter. It's March 21, 1940. That was before even I was born. And she's uh, discussing titles for a new book that she's writing. But she said, we have been so anxious to avoid the charge of dogmatism and heresy hunting that we have rather lost sight of the idea that Christianity is supposed to be an interpretation of the universe. And I think in Christian scholarly circles, we have lost the idea that a Christian worldview is supposed to be global in its focus, and centered on Christ. We're myopic. So I've been working on worldview for over 30 years, and I've, I've come to a diagnosis of three forms. You know how you go to the doctor and they'll say, now you have a form of this disease. Well, I think I can offer at least three forms of myopia. But worldview myopia overall is just a short-sighted worldview that neglects the scope and the breadth of Christ's all-encompassing lordship. So it's not comprehensive because it's not encompassing all of life in the world. It's not truly Christian because it's not centered on Christ. And it's not truly global because it's not embracing the global mission of Christ. So here's our diagnosis. First of all, we have epistemological myopia. This is a worldview that's too narrow because it neglects Christ's lordship over all things. And it's an epistemologically truncated worldview. In other words, this is the worldview that I find very common throughout Europe and North America. Christ's lordship is spiritual. Christ is lord of the spiritual things like reading the Bible, prayer, going to church. Oh yes, he is lord of this. But we forget that he is lord of everything else too. So it leads to what what I like to call an ontological schizophrenia, and actually that's not my term. But Bonhoeffer talked about a compartmentalization that separates the world into two parts. So that Christ, Bonhoeffer said, becomes a partial and a provincial matter within the limits of reality. My buddy David Noggle wrote a whole book on worldview, and he's the one that used this term <coughs> ontological schizophrenia. Now my friend Glenn Harrison, who's here, who's a psychiatrist, wrote me the other day and he took issue with my term ontological schizophrenia. I'll, I'll, I'll sort that out with him a little later, but I think you get the idea. There's a lot of people in churches that think God is the God of the spiritual, but not the God of their job, certainly not the God of their academic discipline, 
not the God of their research. Harry Blameers wrote one of the first great books on a Christian mind. And in fact, that's what he called it. Came out years and years ago, back in the 30s. And I want you to catch the passion in his voice because he's contrasting this, this sacred secular dichotomy. He says, on the one hand is the assumption that all is over when you die. That's most of the people in our nations or in our universities. On the other hand is the almost crushing awareness of a spiritual war tearing at the heart of the university, of the universe, pushing its ruthless way into the lives of men, stabbing at you now, 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 in the impulses and choices of every waking moment, the belief that the thoughts and actions of every hour are molding a soul which is on its way to eternity, that we are choosing every moment of our lives in obedience or disobedience to the God who created and sustains all that is. And then he asked this, do we as Christians mentally inhabit a world with a heaven above it and a hell beneath it, a world in which man is called to live daily, hourly, in contact with the God whom neither time nor space can limit? Do we in this respect think Christianly? The truth is, for the most part, we don't. So that's our challenge, to think Christianly about every aspect of life. So that means we deny this sacred secular dichotomy that is so popular in evangelical churches throughout Europe and in North America. Now, one of my heroes was Abraham Kuyper, Dutch Reformed pastor in the Netherlands. Where Christina comes from, yes, and Lisa from Netherlands. Kuyper was a pastor, later became prime minister of Holland at the turn of the last century. And he, at the founding of the Free University, said there is not one square inch of the entire creation about which Jesus Christ does not cry out, this is mine. And that's our job as scholars, to declare Christ's lordship. Neil Plandiga, who was formerly president of Calvin Seminary, wrote a great book that uh, I require parts of it for our Cambridge Scholars Network readings, Engaging God's World. It's a great book. But he says there, the whole world belongs to God. The whole world has fallen, and so the whole world needs to be redeemed. Every last person, place, organization, and program, all rocks and trees and skies and seas, in fact, every square inch, as Abraham Kuyper said, the whole creation is, quoting Calvin, a theater for the mighty works of God, first in creation and then in recreation. That's our task as scholars to proclaim the Lordship of Christ. Dallas Willard wrote an article for the Christian Scholars Review several years ago called Jesus the Logician. Amazing article. Dallas was a philosophy professor from the University of Southern California. And he was fond of saying, Jesus is the smartest man in the world. Jesus knows more about your field than anyone else in the world. So we need to ask his opinion. We need to seek his perspective on subjects that we're wrestling with. N.T. Wright put it like this, there can be no dualistic division between some areas which Christ rules and others which he does not. So what do we respond as Christian scholars? We respond that whatever our discipline, Christ is the Lord of every detail in that, in that discipline. So here's a, here's a bottom line for me. A Christian worldview is, by definition, a Christ-centered, all-encompassing worldview that includes everything under the Lordship of Christ. So that means a dualistic worldview that claims to be Christian, a dualistic Christian worldview that divides the world into sacred and secular is an oxymoron. It, it doesn't work. A second form of myopia would be what I'm calling missiological myopia. This is a provincial worldview because it neglects the global mission of Christ to all peoples and all nations. 
It's a missiologically truncated worldview where Christ's lordship is either primarily cerebral in our heads or it's spiritual, the spiritual realm, but certainly not both. So it results in a missiological schizophrenia. So there's two worlds, the world of evangelism and missions and then the academic world. Now, in North America, many Christian scholars, when you ask them about evangelism or missions, they quickly distance themselves. And they say, well, uh, I, I'm an academic. I'm, I'm not involved in missions. I'm not involved in, in evangelism. As if any follower of Jesus can politely excuse themselves and walk out of the room. With this myopia, there is very little attention given to a global perspective. Hardly any mention of our commitment to make Christ known around the world and to every person. The Christ who came to redeem all the world. I've been reading worldview literature for over 30 years, and I've got to tell you that most American Christian worldview books are woefully barren of any mention of our global Christ. There's hardly any missions vision in those worldview books. Hardly any worldview books and articles that I know are throbbing with a passion to make Christ known around the world. It's like they have their own dichotomy and missions is over here in some other category, certainly not theirs. Especially in the US, much of the worldview literature is not a worldview, it's a country view. It's a political or now in most cases, a social justice agenda for a country, but not a all encompassing missions vision. So here's the bottom line, a truly Christian worldview must be fully committed to the supremacy of Christ as Lord of all nations and all people groups, and so as global in its scope and missional in its focus. John Stott always reminded us, we serve a global God. I can practically yeah. hear that beautiful British accent saying it. God's plan from the beginning has been global. I mean, just, just a quick survey. Uh, look at uh, Psalm 86, uh, 9. All the nations you have made will come and worship before you, O Lord. They will bring glory to your name. Psalm 96, 3. This is a command. Declare his glory among the nations. 97, 9. For you, O Lord, are over all the earth. What does all leave out? I bring you, the angels announced, I bring you good news that is for all the people. Romans 16, 26, Jesus is revealed in through, uh, through Scripture so that all nations might believe and obey Him. 1 Timothy 2, 3, God our Savior desires, how many? Everyone to be saved. Now, as a Christian academic, my desires need to be reflected in, uh, need to reflect Christ's desires. So I need to be wrestling with what can I do to do my part to see that everyone at least has the opportunity. 2 Peter 3, 9, God is not wanting anyone, not anyone to perish, but he wants everyone to come to repentance. The passage we just read a while ago, all, 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 all throughout, Christ came to see all. The cosmic breadth of this Colossians passage is overwhelming. So you see, Christ looks at every nation and says, this is mine. He looks at every language group and says, this is mine. He looks at every discipline and says, this is mine. So Christ is the Lord of Bibliology and he's the Lord of Biology. He's the Lord of Soteriology and he's the Lord of Physics. He's the Lord of Hamartiology and he's the Lord of Geology. He's the Lord of every occupation. He's the Lord of farming and he's the Lord of ditch digging. He's the Lord of academics and he's the Lord of psychiatry. He's the Lord of it all. 
and he wants every person to come to know him. One of my old favorite authors is Elton Trueblood. He is an evangelical Quaker, and one of the great books he wrote was The Incendiary Fellowship. And he said, the only evidence that anything is on fire is the pragmatic evidence that other fires are started by it. A fire that does not spread must eventually go out. A person who claims to have a religious experience yet makes no effort to share or to extend it has not really entered into Christ's company at all. In short, and this is a biting indictment, an unevangelistic or unmissionary Christianity is a contradiction in terms. So we can say fairly enough, a Christian worldview, by definition, is to be Christ-centered. If it's not Christ-centered, then it certainly won't have a passion to make Christ known. So an unevangelistic or unmissionary Christian worldview is an oxymoron. As Christian academics, we should be the most evangelistic. We should be the most missionary-minded of any group in the church because we're committed to this worldview that is Christ-centered. Well, how do we correct a missiologically truncated worldview? Where are some ideas? Pray for your students and your colleagues by name every day. As I mentioned, we uh, lived and taught in Lithuania for five years. I have two of my Lithuanian colleagues here with me today. Thank you from coming from Lietuva, Labas Rytas. My wife would have about, her, her PhD is in second language acquisition, so philology. She would have about 120 students per semester. And Lithuanian names, I'm sorry my friends, but for the American ear, they're very difficult sometimes. Jovita, that's easy, but some are very difficult. So she had a difficult time knowing their names. So she did this, she took a picture of each one, put their name under it, and then would go through praying for them by name every morning and every night. And often we would go through the list together, about 120 names. Well, two things happened. First of all, we were quite confident that she was probably the first person in the lives of many of those students who had someone praying for them. Probably the first person. And secondly, it sure helped her to memorize their names. All of a sudden, the Lord would help her to remember their names. And so she would have students that would say, and now we were in a really, our university was known as the most Soviet university in the country. It was Vilnius Pedagogical University, later Lithuania University of Education. And it was, everybody agreed, most, Jovita is nodding your head, most Soviet university in the country probably. Very backwards and very closed. And so she, many students would say, Terry, you are, Dr. Terry, you're the first professor to ever call me by name. And she would say, well, what do the other professors call you? they say, stupid, idiot. And they were serious. They did. We heard this. So pray for your students and your colleagues by name every day. Now, when you're working with colleagues that are unbelievers, that's going to press your patience because sinners act like sinners, and they're going to get on your nerves. But if you're praying for them each day, Joe Bailey used to say, prayer is a secret way of loving someone. So pray for them by name. Secondly, pray for the global expansion of the church. There's a, there's a big book that comes out about every seven to 10 years called Operation World, and it's a prayer guide to all the nations. Pray your way through this book. Invite students and colleagues to your apartment. Now, I know that in many, many of your countries, that's not culturally natural. We had students in our apartment all the time in Lithuania. And many, of course, none of them had ever been in any professor's apartment before. We had our colleagues. And many of our colleagues had worked together for all the years since independence from the Soviet Union. So 25 years they'd worked together and they told us it's the first time we've ever met together socially 
outside of the department office. First time. As believers, we should be the people that are drawing people together. So it's, is, it, is it time consuming? Yes. Is it costly? <laughs> yes. Is it sometimes frustrating? Yeah, it can be. But it's wonderfully rewarding. So invite people. How can you pray for them to find Jesus if you're not investing in getting to know them? Because God isn't usually going to just pop in, parachute down by the Holy Spirit and bomb, zap them with the gospel. He usually works through relationships. Usually. That's the way it works. So four, share the gospel with your colleagues, with your students and others. In appropriate ways, I know. There's a protocol in the academy, and that's a whole other talk. My colleague Daniel Hill, a philosophy professor from Liverpool, always gives this lecture each year at our Cambridge Scholars Network for doctoral students. And one of his points of advice is, do street evangelism. Now, a philosophy professor doing street evangelism, that doesn't seem to go together, but he said, when you're doing street evangelism, first of all, nobody cares about your credentials. Uh, Lyra, you do some street evangelism, both of you, Vika and Lyra from Ukraine, Dnipro, you do street evangelism. Nobody cares on the streets what your academic credentials are. They really don't care. They could care less. And it also tells you what the real issues are that people are facing. And it also trains you, as the academic, how do I communicate with these people? It's rough in uh, many of these countries. Financially support mission efforts. Do research projects, which in some way could advance the gospel. And that, uh, Daniel gives a great talk on that. I could send it to you. Give public lectures on topics related to your academic field. Uh, that's one of the main things I'm doing these days, is doing lectures at universities on what I would call pre-evangelism. I'm not making a case for Christ, but it's pre-evangelism. So I was in Ukraine a couple of weeks ago giving a talk called Murder, Mystery, and Sex, Understanding the World's Best-Selling Work of Classic Literature. And it's basically a bid for people to read the Bible, to realize what, fasc what a fascinating book it is. And I gave the lecture at Zielina, down just over the mountain here in Slovakia. And students respond. They've never had anybody talk to them about the Bible and what fascinating what a fascinating book it is. And then I read portions of the Bible. And then link with scholars. Well, we have one final myopia, and that's what I call spiritual myopia, or we might call it unspiritual myopia. This is a worldview that is impersonal, cold, not passionate for Christ, not fervent in obeying Him. It's a spiritually truncated worldview. Where Christ's lordship is important, but mostly is a scholarly concern. It's mostly abstract. It's mostly theoretical. It's not personal. It doesn't lead to worship. It doesn't lead to obedience. Now, this is one that I'm really an expert on by my own personal experience. Now, this is uh, the personal confession time. Here's my problem. I can easily affirm Christ is the Lord of every field of study. He's the Lord of every galaxy of the entire cosmos. He's the Lord of every university and every academic field. He's the Lord of everything. Meanwhile, I forget, easily forget, that He is to be Lord of every nook and crevice of my life. Christ is to be Lord of what I wear, what I eat, where I go. Christ is to be Lord of every thought, every look, every action, every dream, every ambition, every, every, everything. And in my life, I have had whole sections of time when I could easily block off that part. And I could very easily pontificate on the ramifications of a Christian worldview for law or for philosophy or for business. And, oh, I could be so eloquent very eloquent, and meanwhile, not walking in full obedience in my own life. I had a time just a few months ago where I was getting ready to leave on a journey. Actually, I was coming to Lithuania to speak at our church's national conference there, and I was going to be meeting with academics in Konus and Vilnius, and I was going to be speaking on Christian worldview. And I got a report about a project that my wife and I had been involved with. 
that we'd invested some in. And I was upset. I was angry. And I was mouthing off about this and that. Now, I'm blessed with a godly wife who is my accountability partner. And she said, Daryl, you can't think like that. You can't harbor those feelings in your heart. That is not right. God is calling you to something higher than this. You can't do this. Now, we're literally 10 minutes from leaving for the airport for me to go do my Christian worldview lectures. And so we say we, we need to pray, which we always do before a church journey, but this was particularly significant that day. And so she prayed, and I prayed. And somehow, somehow that day, God touched, and the Holy Spirit came and, and eradicated that, that ugly attitude, that anger, that bitterness, and just brought a lightness and freshness and freedom that I could not have engineered. I couldn't have talked myself into it. It had to be God. It had to be Him. But do you see what was happening? I was, oh, fully prepared. I had my notes and everything ready to talk about a Christian worldview. Oh, yes, I'm the expert on this worldview business. And I myself was harboring sin in my heart through this anger, through this bitterness. Now, fortunately, the Holy Spirit is faithful and He challenges us. And fortunately, my wife was faithful in rebuking me in love, but rebuking me nevertheless. So our challenge, brothers and sisters, is to listen to the Holy Spirit. So today, am I becoming more like Jesus? Am I becoming more generous, kinder, holier, more thoughtful? Am I becoming easier to get along with? more patient, purer in my thoughts, freer of lust, more saturated with the Word. This is the heart of a Christian worldview. As we surrender to Him and we ask the Holy Spirit to purify us and fill us and invade every part of our lives. Oswald Chambers put it like this. We slander God by our very eagerness to work for Him without knowing Him and how easy that is for us to do. And a friend of Oswald Chambers' family was Os Guinness's parents, so they named him after Oswald Chambers. And so Oz, and his, one of his more recent books, Renaissance, which you really must read, put it like this. What changes the world is not a fully developed Christian worldview, but a worldview actually lived. In other words, in Christian lives that are the Word made flesh again. That's our challenge, brothers and sisters. So, here it is. In spite of my many failures to live this, a Christian worldview by definition is a Christ-centered worldview that falls in worship and obedience before our living Christ. So a cold, cerebral Christian worldview that has no passion for Jesus and is not living in obedience to Him is once again an oxymoron. So how do we respond to these forms? So any Christian worldview that's not global in its scope, passionate for Christ, and all-encompassing in its breadth is theologically erroneous, philosophically shallow, missiologically truncated, epistemologically inadequate, and sociologically myopic. So this is a worldview that would be clear-sighted. We're affirming Christ's lordship over all things. Everything is sacred. Nothing is beyond Christ's dominion. His lordship is all-encompassing. Missions, our vision is global. We're affirming His Mission to all nations, all people groups. 
So for us, scholarship, evangelism, and mission are all important. It's not either or. It's not a dichotomy. And so we recognize he's Lord over all peoples as well as over our subject. And then, really, really, this is the difficult part for some of us. We're personal and passionate in our worldview. So he's Lord over every nook and crevice of our lives. We're called to be holy, and that's what a Christian worldview calls us to. So, my brothers and sisters, we serve a global God, and the essence of this Christian worldview cries out to be proclaimed to every person in the world. That's what, that's what we're called to do. So let us be faithful.